You're listening to Polycast, an official podcast of the Bolton Civilization site. We're talking about Civilization Revolution. I'm Daniel Quick, known as Dan Q on the forum, and with me is Anna Lee Barney, who goes by Cartamandua. Hello. We have with us a very special guest from 2K Games lead producer, Jason, Jason 2K Bergman. Hello. Now CivRev is available worldwide. The Xbox 360, the PlayStation 3, and the DS. That's a lot of what I do. Make sure that everybody knows what they're doing and does it. That's the life of the producer. So did you get much tribute? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, 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 I did. You were the lead producer for Civilization Revolution at 2K Games. What were your responsibilities during the game's development, and what is your involvement to be now in post-release? I am the producer on Civilization Revolution. So a lot of what I do is I work directly with the development team, and I work with our QA team, and I work with PR, and I work with marketing. And I kind of coordinate everything. You know, I make sure the game is coming along. I make sure that everybody gets what they need to get everything done. So, you know, I do stuff like gameplay feedback, but I also do stuff like work directly with the QA teams, and I work with marketing to make sure that they have everything they need. And there's a lot. Being a producer means you do a lot of different stuff. One of the weirder things I did is I named all the achievements on the Xbox 360. We had all those really wacky quotes we used. I came up with a lot of those, and one of them came from my wife. They came from all over the place. It's very hard to describe what a producer does, because every day is something different. Sounds like some good, fun diversity. It is. It it never gets boring. It can get a little hectic, but it never really gets boring. Post-release, we've been working to get patches and DLC done. So we have a whole lot of DLC coming, and we've been working for post-release support, because obviously we've had some issues to fix. So that's what I'm doing right now. You joined Take-Two Interactive in its PR department in 2004, and by 2006 was its PR manager. The same year, you moved into product development and became the internal producer on games from developer for Axis Games, which has been an in-house studio of Take-Two Interactive since late 2005. Does this mean that you spend more time working with Firaxians than 2 k <laughs> It depends. Some some weeks, yes, I talk almost exclusively for Axis all day long, even though I'm on the other side of the country. And some days, not so much. I do work on other titles than just for Axis titles. We just announced Champions Online. I'm producing that for 2K as well. And that's developed here on the West Coast. But some days, especially with latent development on Civ Rev, yes, I was knee-deep in Civ and talking to for Axis more or less all day long and mostly for Axis. You know, it, it really just depends on what I'm doing at any given time. Oh, okay. So being the internal producer on games from Fraxis, that's not exclusively. No, no, not at all. I mean, I did work on, I worked on Bioshock and I worked on The Darkness as well while I was doing, what was that, Warlords and Beyond the Sword and Railroads. I do work on non-Fraxis stuff occasionally. Mostly, though, I am, Fraxis titles are my titles. Those are my big titles. But I'm usually working on something else on the side. What playtesting, if any, of Civrev is done outside of Fraxis in 2K during development? Because CivRev is a console game, we didn't do the kind of... Usually, you know, Fraxis has their external beta team for all their PC titles. That's obviously... That was super important to Civ 4, and it's been done with Warlords and Beyond the Sword, and we're doing it with Colonization as well. And because it's a console game, you can't really do that with CivRev. So what we did do is we did a bunch of focus tests. We did them uh, out in Baltimore, and we did them uh, in L.A. as well. For those, we bring people in, we set them down, they play the game, they talk to us. We did some user testing where someone would play in our office and I would be sitting right behind them or someone else would be sitting right behind them and we'd watch and see what they do. And then obviously we have our QA teams who would be playing it nonstop around the clock for months on end. But we didn't really do the kind of widespread beta testing that we do for the PC titles. I'm a big fan of playtesting. I think you get a lot out of it and certainly for gameplay balancing it's super important. And of course Fraxis brought in a couple of members of the uh, Civ community to uh, playtest the game last yep. fall. Yep. Yeah. They always do that. <laughs> Would you happen to know who those people were there, Jason? I believe one of them was you, if I remember correctly. 
You do remember correctly, you remembered. Aww. <laughs> I remember reading your exhaustive preview. So. <laughs> Jason was thinking, oh my gosh, is it over yet? Oh, rub it in. <laughs> exhaustive multi-part preview. It was really neat to see that. Especially since, if I remember correctly, a lot of things about the game have changed since that first... I don't know if you've played the final version yet, but no. we have done a lot of tweaks since then. I admit, Jason, that unlike Anna Lee, who actually at least owns a Wii, I don't own any consoles. You're not even a DS, huh? No, not even a DS. The last console platform I ever played for any length of time, and I didn't own that either, was the uh, <clears throat> Super Nintendo. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, things have changed since then a little bit. Only a little. Jason, how were you introduced to the Civilization series, and which titles in it have you played, and what's it like to now work on a game in the series? My first Civilization was the first Civilization. I didn't have a PC that could run it at the time, but I had a friend whose father was a huge Sid Meier fan, and he got it, and I played it at his place, and I played the heck out of that. And then when I was in college, when Civ 2 came out, and I think I almost dropped out of college because of Civ 2. So then I played Civ 2 like crazy. I played Test of Time, I played Civ 3, I played the expansions for Civ 3. So yeah, I've, I've been a huge, huge fan of Civ and Sid since the very beginning. My first Sid Meier game was Pirates, which was the first game to actually have the Sid Meier name above the title. So I've been a fan for a very long time. It's, it's great. I mean, I, I did PR for Civ 4, and even before we even signed Civ 4, I remember I was in a meeting with our now president, and he was going to meet with these guys... Because apparently Atari was interested in selling this franchise called Civilization, and I never heard of Sid Meier. And, you know, and it's one of those meetings where I'm sitting there and I'm giggling like a schoolgirl. <laughs> <laughs> this was before there was a 2K. This was back when we were doing, you know, our biggest title was Stronghold. And I was super excited and just thought of working on a Sid Meier game. It was definitely a dream come true to work with all those guys. As a matter of fact, when I purchased Civilization II, uh, I couldn't have a computer that uh, ran it, so I went over to my grandmother's house and used her computer. And <laughs> <laughs> I think I figured if I did that enough, then maybe my parents would be uh, annoyed enough that uh, we'd get a better computer in the house so I could actually play it here. And uh, it worked. It, it worked. It took a few months, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it worked. There you go. From humble beginnings, you will build. Talking about the platforms a little bit, in the DS version, apparently there is no Civilpedia and the manual is bare bones and perhaps not very informative. Will it be possible to have a Civilpedia on the official DS website for users as a reference tool? Yeah, this was a question from Dexter's. A couple of things about the DS version. DS version, we're using the maximum cart size that is possible. We're using the largest cart with the largest memory space. If I remember correctly, the other part of that question was about the number of save games in there. So we have maxed out that cart, so there is no room on there for anything. <laughs> so we had to cut out Civilopedia. We couldn't do the Trophy Room or the Hall Glory were also taken out. There's just so much text already in a Civ game, so much art. And because we're using the same game core, the game core is identical between PS3, 360, and DS, we need a lot more space than your average DS game. So, short version, no, we couldn't do a Civilopedia. As for putting something on the website, the Civilopedia is a lot of licensed stuff from National Geographic, and because of that, we can't post a Civilopedia on the website. It's not in our deal with National Geographic. Gosh, I want to say at one point we were going to post a manual on the website that was an expanded version, but I don't know whatever happened with that. I go, I'll make a note and see what I can do. Because, yeah, I remember the DS manual we had to cut down by, like, at least a third because the amount of space in that box, the DS box, is so tiny that that manual is not super useful. And I apologize for that, but they make you stick because you got, like, okay, so you got your DS manual, you've got your... Nintendo official booklet on using the DS. You've got your Wi-Fi manual that Nintendo makes you include in there. So you've already got a small manual, but then they make you throw like four or five other manuals in there that you can't even edit. So I will see if we can get that original version of the DS manual posted somewhere. And if not, then I don't know. We'll figure something out because, yeah, I, I totally I understand and can relate to the problem. And certainly that's something the fan sites can do. They can certainly take all the text and transcribe it and do what it is fan sites do because they're awesome. Woohoo! <laughs> Nice little plug there. <laughs> I like fan sites. Fan sites are good for us. We like fans. You said you put in the maximum number of saves that you would be able to have uh, on the cartridge, at least with all the other information in there. Is that five? I think I, I've read that it was five. You can have five saves. That sounds about right. Yeah, there are five. I believe there are five on DS and ten on 360, and it's unlimited on PS3. On the PS3, we use Sony's save system. 
and there's no limitation to that. On 360, we had to write our own, and we had to incorporate the ability to save on a memory card, so we had to put a limit on there. But on PS3, we just use Sony's, and everybody has a hard drive, and the minimum hard drive is 20 gigs, so yeah, there's tons of space on it. You can have a million save files on PS3 if you want. Wow. It's your own hard drive. Question. He says, I can see why a DS version makes more sense with the touchscreen commands, but why is there no PSP version being made? Regarding other versions of the game, it's not my call. Obviously, we would love to see Civ on every platform that exists, and certainly if there's the demand, then maybe that'll happen. For this title, for Civ Rev, we maxed out the number of people at For Axis to make this game. So we could only do PS3, 360, and DS right now. If there's a demand, and if there's the manpower somewhere, then maybe, yes, there will be a PSP version someday. I love my PSP. I travel with my PSP right now. I kind of alternate between DS and PSP. Right now I'm playing more PSP games than I am DS. So I would love to see a PSP version of this game. I think we can do it really well. But right now we have no plans. We have not announced any other versions. So all I can say is buy the DS version or tell people who own DSs to buy the DS version if you want a PSP version. And that's uh, PSC, that's uh, PlayStation Portable, in case anybody's wondering, why are these people using acronyms? I don't understand. (laughs) And I suppose that that answer would also go for the Wii. Yeah, so the Wii version is still, as we've announced, is still on indefinite hiatus. If there is demand for the PS3 and 360 versions, and pleased to say that the game is selling very well, then maybe someday we'll bring back the Wii version. But right now, we have not announced any plans for other versions. Sad. It's not my call, so you can <laughs> demand all you want from me that you want a Wii version, and I can agree with you. <laughs> uh, and there's not much more I can do than that. So. Well, my very public opinion is that I'll never buy a PS3 or an Xbox, but I have a Wii, and I wanted so badly to play <laughs> some friends. I have a Wii, too. I love my Wii. <laughs> Would love to be able to play Civ on my Wii. So, sure, I'm with you. <laughs> Maybe someday. <laughs> Make it happen. <laughs> Lastly, on platforms from Antwerpo, I hope I'm saying the uh, username properly, he says, quote, I want a really good argument on the no, we will not do any further PS3 support as we just want to focus on our planned downloadable content, unquote, response. If future firmware upgrade would break CivRev, this means that we would be left with the game we paid for and that we will never be able to play again, unquote. Okay, so this guy, I think he's misinterpreting some things he's read on the forums, and he may actually be reading secondhand responses and not actually what we said. We're obviously supporting PS3. If a firmware upgrade were to come out that breaks CivRev, yes, we would fix it. We're not silly. We love our PS3 users. I own a PS3. I play the game on PS3. What he's confusing this with is we've said that, no, we're not going to add support for... Sony just released the 2.41 firmware upgrade that adds in trophy support, which is the PS3 equivalent of achievements, and it adds in-game music streaming. And we've said that, no, we can't add those things to Sivrat, and that instead we're going to do downloadable content, which adds some new cool stuff to the game. But we're not adding those specific PS3 features. We are working to support PS3. We are working on a PS3 patch as we speak. It is not going to add either of those features. And the reason for that is that those are not small features. In order to get music streaming, we would have to rewrite our music system, which we can't do because the game's out, and that's not really something you do post-ship. We don't have any means of adding in trophy support. We have achievement support on 360 because we plan for achievement support all along. We didn't know about trophies' existence until very, very recently, way after the game was basically done. And we can't just go back and add that in because it's not a small thing to do. So, no, we're not adding those features. Yes, we're going to support PS3. If there's a new firmware upgrade, we will do our best to make sure the game works before that firmware upgrade comes out, assuming Sony keeps us in loop on these things, which they don't always necessarily do. But if there is a problem, we will fix it, and we will continue to support PS3. Where is our time machines when we need it? I mean, really. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, basically. (laughs) If we had known about trophies a year and a half ago, or even a year, or even nine months ago, we would have been able to do it. But Sony did not tell us about this planned feature until very, very recently, and the game was done. I mean, we can't just go back and add those features without opening up a whole other can of worms and potentially breaking the rest of the game. And now that the game is shipped, it's certainly not a possibility. We just don't have the manpower, don't want to go doing that. So I apologize to anyone who owns a PS3 and really wants those features, but we're not the only people doing this. I mean, GTA is not getting trophy support. Metal Gear Solid is not getting trophy support. Right now, there is literally one game that has trophy support, and it's Super Stardust HD. Hopefully I'm remembering properly, but on the official forums, was that the game, Jason, you had said that, at least I think it was you, that the company was adding a whole another year to the development That's Burnout Paradise. Yeah, they said they've devoted an entire year to post-launch support, which is great if you're EA and you have a huge team to do nothing but work on your game after ship. But I think people want to see the next games from Firaxis. You may not know what they are, but they're fantastic, and I think you'd rather see those than have us add in one more feature 
that is not super important to the PS3 version only of Civilization Revolution. Mm, that statement just made me get a little bit excited. <laughs> <laughs> In uncharted worlds, you will explore Madre! against rival civilizations. You will fight. Move on to gameplay, shall we? What is your favorite civilization to play in Civ Rev and why? Ah, uh, gosh. So that's actually a difficult question because usually I don't play just one Civ. Kind of go through phases. Depends what I'm trying to win as. Obviously, if I'm going for culture, I'll probably play as Rome because Rome's nice and easy for culture. If I'm going for military, I'll either play as Aztec or Mongolia. If I'm going for general growth, I tend to like India or China. I like all of them. I do play as all of them. It really varies. It, it depends on what I'm really trying to do. I like Egypt a lot. And the reasons are, you know, Sivrev is a very different game from past civilizations in that the, the leaders are all very different. You know, they all have their different bonuses, and they all have very specific gameplay bonuses associated with them. My favorite of those bonuses, I love the Mongolian bonus, which is barbarians turn into settlements as soon as you take them, which is awesome. So if you want to quickly expand, then you just play Mongolia and you just go and immediately go for all the barbarian encampments and just get five cities before five turns are done. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's not quite the same. You know, previously, like, with Civs 1 through 3, I almost always played as Rome, just because I like playing as Rome. But with Civ Rev, it's just, it's a lot different. You know, so I'll play as anybody. That's very politically correct of you. For some reason, I hate Russia. I don't know why. <laughs> I never play as Russia. They get the world map. That just doesn't seem that exciting. All right. Jason hates Russia. We have our special title. <laughs> I hate Russia. I hate Russians. I hate, you know, <laughs> the whole region of the world. No, I just don't care for it. <laughs> I'm kidding, obviously. As you mentioned, liking the Mongolian ability specifically, it was in the ninth episode of the official Civ Rev podcast where uh, Sid said that it was actually the last civilization to have a significant makeover in that respect, that it was felt that whatever the ability the Mongolians had before that was lame. I believe it was plus one movement for cavalry or plus one attack. It became a later bonus, I think. That was their original one. And then when it went, it went in, it was as soon as you take a barbarian settlement, they become settlers, which was crazy overpowered. I mean, you get settlers, you can move them to like the best place on the map, and you can just keep doing that over and over and over again. And suddenly you've got this huge, awesome civilization. So what the scale back for balancing on that is that they become a settlement instead of settlers, so you can't actually move them. So wherever that barbarian encampment is, is where your new city becomes. And it's still powerful, but it balanced a lot better now. That last question was from Widowmaker313. This one here from Sergeant Grimes. In light of the general criticism that the AI in Civrev is too aggressive, both in reviews and on the forums, does Fraxis the 2K have any plans to respond to that by perhaps toning it down a little? Not right now, no. The AI is as Sid intended it. If you have specific issues, please post in the forums. We do read the forums. But no, right now we have no plans to tone down the AI. I think we're pretty happy with it. But we're open to suggestions, but right now, no, I think we're fine with it. And having seen the official 2K forums, not only does 2K read the forums, but they respond as well. Very impressive, I must say. We try. <laughs> <laughs> the game has a turn limit with games ending in 2100 AD without the possibility of continuing to play on. The game ends when you hit 2100 AD. You either win or lose a time victory at that point. You can't keep playing after you've finished a victory condition. You know, in Civ 4, you can hit just one more turn, right. right, and then keep playing without a score. You can just keep playing to see how big your civilization can get. With Civ Rev, yeah, there is a turn limit. You can't keep playing after that. There are a bunch of technical reasons, and there are a bunch of gameplay reasons for it. We didn't put that in lightly. It was done very specifically. It was done for gameplay balancing. And as with all things, it was a call by Sid. Sid wanted it that way. That's the way it is. Sid's word is law. The release of the 1.1 patch for the PS3 in Europe had included that gameplay change. When you add a settler to an existing city, it doesn't uh, increase the population by one. It just increases the food stores. That's a multiplayer exploit that came up. It's called the Mega City Exploit, where one guy, what you do is you create one city, and then you have like five satellite cities like a couple of tiles away, right? And all those satellite cities, you just have them cranking out settlers and moving those settlers to the big city and joining them to the big city, because every single time, it just makes that city go up by one, no matter how big they are. And it just became a giant multiplayer exploit. And so our fix for that is to make it so it only adds food. And that's only for multiplayer. In single player, you can still do that. Multiplayer is a big focus for us with this title, and the 1.2 patch has a bunch of exploit fixes in it. Darn. <laughs> <laughs> We are rushing as fast as we can to get it out the door. 
hopefully by the time this is released, we'll have already released it because we really want to get that out. So we put our DLC on hold for now just so we can get that out the door. It seems like it's very needed on PS3. From Random Fires, could you explain the histograph at Games End? What's with the symbols? <laughs> so, this is one of those cases where I believe the DS version has a feature, the other two versions don't. I'm pretty sure the DS version histograph actually has a legend. We, for some reason, did not include the legend on the PS3 and Xbox 360. <laughs> I think we're going to post them to the forums, so keep an eye on that, and maybe we'll post it on the official website. I was just looking at this list the other day because it never really dawned on me either that, oh yeah, you know, we never actually mentioned what those symbols mean. The histograph, it's like combat or growth or something or other, and it's the kind of thing I can't really describe over a podcast. So we'll post something on, on the website. Could that be something that could be added to a patch as well? Um, it might be. We'll see. Okay. And by might be, Jason means yes. <laughs> no. No, 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 no. No, no, no. I'm not committing to anything, but certainly keep an eye on the forums and the website and we'll throw something up there. I'm just trying to get you in trouble, Jason. That's all. <laughs> that's okay. I'm always in trouble. Trouble is fun. <laughs> it's dangerous to do interviews with Dan. <laughs> Against the test of time, you stand. Is there any chance that an Earth map or a larger map to generate bigger random maps will be made available? And in addition to bigger maps, the option for more sieves in a single game? Map size and the number of sieves are hard-coded by Sid. That can't change. That is definitely not changing. As for specific maps, we have plans for DLC, and you'll be hearing more about that soon. Very straightforward. So, uh, easy question. Yeah. <laughs> so that was from Viva Revolution, and the second one from him or her. Any chance for custom single-player games? Well, we might already have our answer. I realize this might not be possible on the consoles, but I thought I'd ask anyway. The game was balanced around a very specific settings, map size, and number sieves, and no. So, no, that's not possible. What we did do as a concession is that's what the scenarios are for. The scenarios are, in lieu of having custom games, we threw in rule change scenarios. So there are scenarios in there, and, you know, I suggest you play with those, because that's what they're there for. So whether that was intentional or not, Jason, that's a perfect segue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> for the next question. <laughs> the eighth episode of the official Civrev podcast talked in part about the game's included scenarios, but we would love to hear about them all. <laughs> what is each about, and who designed them? <laughs> okay. Well, they were designed by the CivRev design team, so Sid on down. As for all of them, well, there are, I believe, 12 in there? Yes, they're very cool. The game's out, so you don't really need me to go through every single one of them. Just go and check them out. They're very <laughs> neat. They range from starting with all technologies to starting with tons of gold to... It's just their rule changes. Because we can't do custom games, we created a bunch of custom games for you to play. Do you have a personal favorite? Uh, I kind of like Beta Centauri, which is kind of neat, mostly because of the title. They're just fun. They're fun little gameplay tweaks. And if you get tired of playing just standard Civ, that's what they're they're there, so you can do neat little stuff. Go check them out. I thought Centauri Alpha might have been a neat title, but Beta <laughs> Centauri works too. <laughs> Sid likes his puns. He's, he's big on puns. Yeah. If, if you played well, if you played a Civ game, then you know there are puns galore. There are lots of puns in Civ Rev. Can Civ Rev players share their save games with each other online? If so, can they do so through their console, or would it need to be computer mediated? If you have a save game for an Xbox 360, your PlayStation probably won't like it very much. This is another case where PS3 has a feature that the other two versions don't. So DS, no, you can't get anything off the cart without doing something illegal. 360, your save games are tied to your profile, so there's no way to get... A, there's no way to get them off there anyways, and B, even if you did, you'd have to give them the profile, which would defeat the purpose, so no, you can do that. On the PS3, however, yes, you can. So on the PS3, you can take a memory stick, a standard memory stick, or you can use the PSP as a storage device, too. If you've got one of the PS3s that have a media reader built in, or if you plug in any standard USB media reader in your PS3, you can put in a memory stick or an SD card or compact flash or any one of those, or even a USB drive, actually. You can just plug that directly in. Copy the save file from your PS3 to the USB drive. Take that USB drive, move it over to your PC copy the save file from the USB drive to your PC, and then you can email them to someone else, and they should be able to load them up on their PS3 by doing the reverse. So yeah, you can do that. Not a problem. You do need a PC. There's no way to email save files, as far as I know, within the PS3 system, although I've never actually tried sending a message with an attachment, so I don't know. Maybe you can do it? I haven't tried that. But um, PS3 save files are movable, whereas they're not on the other platforms. So if you really wanted to, yes, you totally could. Go for it. <laughs> 
I encourage it. From Abby Revo, what sort of downloadable content besides the already announced scenarios and wonders will we see for CivRev? Any new civs? As for DLC, we're not really talking about it, but new civs would require a lot. I don't want to say never, because you never know, but it is unlikely. We do have awesome stuff planned for downloadable content, though. Will the DS version have downloadable content? Easy question. Unfortunately, no. The DS does not allow for downloadable content, and not only that, but we've maxed out that cart as it is, so there's no room on there. There's one game out there that claims to have... I actually looked into this because they came out while we were towards the end of development on CivRev. Professor Layton claims to have downloadable content. They say that every week you can, quote, download a new puzzle. And all they're doing is they're unlocking it on the cart. Oh. So they're doing kind of like what we do with the game of the week, where it checks the clock on the server and unlocks something on your system for it. So yeah, so if we wanted to be mean and put all the content on the cart already when we shipped, and then say, okay, now you're going to download a new map and just unlock it on the cart, we could have done that. But that, I don't like that. That's kind of sleazy. Yeah. So no, there won't be any DLC for DS. I, I apologize. Uh, there was just no way to do it. The fact that they market that as downloadable content. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a little underhanded, mm. I think. Yeah. Yeah, that, so that, that, that was kind of mean. We looked into it. Not possible, unfortunately. Nintendo doesn't allow for any way of doing it. Someday, they're now starting to allow DLC on Wii, which is kind of cool. So maybe they'll someday bring that to DS. But right now, it's not. Do you believe there could or even should be official downloadable content for Civ 5 if or when it comes to pass? Or even Civ 4? Well, um... Since we haven't <laughs> announced or talked or said or even confirmed the existence of a Civ 5 if or when such a project should ever happen. I certainly can't speak about that. As for downloadable content for Civ 4, Civ 4 is primarily a retail product. You know, we're focused on, we've done our expansion packs for that, and now we're doing colonization, which is kind of an offshoot of Civ 4. Downloadable content is cool. I think it's neat. I think it's fun. I really couldn't say if our future PC products will have DLC. I know Microsoft is encouraging that sort of thing. So maybe but I really couldn't say any more than that. So vague. I know. I apologize. Just kidding. <laughs> no, we're just seasoned, yeah. <laughs> when the world is in your hands, how will you rule? So moving into a bit of a reflection now, the initial reception to Civ Rev seemed to be from the can it be pulled off to the it can't possibly be pulled off, particularly some parts of the well-established PC Civ community. With critic and user reviews coming in more and more, the growing consensus is that CivRev has pulled it off. Personally, Jason, what are you most and least satisfied with the games, and what features, if any, did you have to scale back or remove altogether during playtesting? Hot seat, perhaps. What am I most satisfied with, I think, is just getting the Civilization gameplay, or even just that kind of game working on a console in a way that feels right and plays well and works. And I don't know if that's ever actually successfully been done before. And so I'm very, very proud of all the work that was done to make that possible. As for what I'm least satisfied with, I don't know. I mean, there are certainly aspects of the game that I think didn't come out quite as well as we had hoped. I think probably the closest thing to that is the throne room, if you haven't played the game. As you play the game, other civilizations who you never actually meet send you these gifts, and you go to your throne room and you view them. You know, so you get like dancing bears, and you get, like, jugglers and acrobats, and the first time you get them, you watch them, and then after maybe even the first time you've seen it, you just skip them, and there's no reason to go back to the throne room, ever. And it's kind of a shame, because it, it's a clever little feature, Sid really liked it, it was reminiscent of the old throne rooms from the earlier Civ games, and it was the kind of thing that was brought back for that reason, but I don't know if it quite ever materialized into something that people really want to use. So maybe I'm a little disappointed about that, but that's basically it. I think generally we accomplished our goal of getting a civilization game to run on those platforms in a way that nobody had ever done before, and I think we did it really well. I don't know about you, Jason, but uh, I prefer my dancing bears to have tutus, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, these do have tutus. <laughs> Woo -hoo! There you go. Uh, yeah. Well, that's it. Dan's going to go buy it now. <laughs> do you believe that with Civ Rev now available that it will increase interest in Civ 4 and Civ in general on the PC? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so do we. <laughs> the Civ gameplay, I think, is one of those most perfect forms of gameplay, if that makes any sense. If somebody plays Civ Rev and they want to try playing Civ 4, I would certainly encourage that, and I hope they do. Fortunately, we're at a point now where Civ 4 will run on most any PC, any recent PC, certainly any recent laptop even. So the barrier to entry is very low. So if somebody plays Civ Rev and they want to try something a little more dense and more in-depth, then yeah, I would absolutely encourage that, and I hope they do. 
Now, this question comes from someone who uh, I liked it when he had it in his forum profile. You know, you list your username, and then on the next line, you could fill in, for example, where you were from. And his username is Pimpy McPimp. Oh, no. And, <laughs> and underneath that, he used to have regrets his username, but he got rid of it. I don't know why that was great. Uh, <laughs> he asks, uh, what lessons have you learned from developing CivRev, if any, that you will apply to a future Civ game for the PC, e.g. games mechanics, game speed, etc.? Well, obviously, they're very different games, and it was very intentional in calling this game Civilization Revolution and not calling it Civ V, because we wanted to make it very clear that this is not intended to replace the PC game. So there's definitely going to be a branch there. If we do another PC game, it's not going to be Civ Rev 2. So we wouldn't want to imply that, okay, now that we've made this game speed fun, we're going to make the next PC game move this fast. We're not going to do anything like that. What we did learn is certainly we learned stuff about making a game that is very graphically vibrant. CivRev is a lot more detailed than any PC Civ has ever been. Certainly a lot of technology stuff that will be applied back. And just interface stuff in general, I think you'll see on CivRev is a lot more I don't know, accessible than Civ 4 was. And on a lot more boring note, things about team structure and things like that. That'll obviously pull back towards the PC version. But I wouldn't want anyone to think that now that we've made this game, we're going to make the next PC game exactly like this, because we're not. Fair enough. I think it's very appropriate for me to ask this next question. Do you think online gaming communities are too male-dominated? Would they benefit from a larger female contingent? Sure. (laughs) (laughs) That's an easy question. Yes, we would welcome more women in the gaming communities. Don't have much more to say than that, then yes. Absolutely. Bring on the women. (laughs) Bring us your women. (laughs) We make games that appeal to, I think, both sexes. I wouldn't want to make a game that was specifically targeted towards women, because I think that's insulting. But yes, we make games for women. We make games for men. And I think communities could certainly benefit from having more women. And I mean, I'm an active member of uh, Shack News, where there are lots of women. My sister has been a gamer as long as I have. My wife played The Sims for a very long time. She plays Civ. She actually playtested CivRev. So... Yes, I absolutely encourage more women to play and get more involved in the gaming community. Excellent answer. Just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) No, I mean the way I said it was just kidding. In my years as a woman in the gaming industry. (laughs) I'm suddenly hearing the, uh, do you know what it feels like for a girl by Madonna? (laughs) (laughs) What advice would you give to those who are trying to break into the gaming industry as a career? That's a good question. Well, the first thing I would do is recommend that people not do it the way I did it. I took probably the longest and most convoluted path to getting my current position of anybody in the entire world. I wouldn't recommend it. What I would recommend is if you want to make games, then I would recommend joining a mod team and making some games. If you're in school, I would look up the closest video game developer to you and find out about an internship. Even if they don't have an internship program, I would just contact them and find out what positions they have and if they have any entry-level stuff. Be very involved in the gaming community. My career came directly out of the gaming community. The industry is not that hard to break into if you're willing to do it. If you're willing to get in at the QA level, there are always QA positions if you live within reasonable proximity to some place with a QA center. If you're in school and they have a gaming program, then I would encourage you to do that if only to meet other people and make a game together. Creating games is the easiest way to get into the industry. I think every game that was in the IGF this year, the Independent Games Festival, every one of those people spoke to publishers that day. It's an easy way to do it. If you're really creative and you want to do it that way, then by all means. If your school has a program, take the program, learn all you can, meet people, get some social skills, and use them, because that's the other really most important thing, is making contacts and getting in that way. And I think I've seen at least some advertisements for some colleges that they now actually have video game development diplomas or degrees or... Yeah, there are a lot of programs, actually. You know, uh, certainly if you live in Texas, the Guildhall at SMU, there's DigiPen. DigiPen is, like, the place to go, really, if you can, just because they're right next to Nintendo and Microsoft and Valve. There's a lot of really good stuff coming out of that. So a lot of major schools have them. A lot of schools, it's kind of a subset of a film program, which is a little wacky. That also tends to be for game designers. So if you want to be an artist, then get a degree in art or just create a portfolio and join a mod team and get your stuff out there that way. If you want to be a producer, then you're really probably going to have to go the QA route. It all depends on what you want. If you want to be a programmer, then program. Join a mod team and write some stuff. The best thing you can do is get informed. Go to GDC. Go to anything you can. Talk to your school. Meet other people. Join mod teams. Join the forums and get as involved as possible. Call in today. In North America, the number is 301-637-7659. That's 301-637-POLY. 
In Europe, 44-121-288-7659. That's 44-121-288-POLY. You can Skype us at the Polycast or email us at polycast at apolton.net. For more information on Polycast, our sibling show Modcast, or about Polycast in general, log on to the series' official website at polycast.apolton.net. Why we went with GameSpy for PS3? We went with GameSpy because GameSpy is what our choice was. I mean, basically on PS3, you either use nothing, you use Demonware, which is owned by Activision, you use GameSpy, which is what we did, or you write your own. And in this case, we went with GameSpy. So that was our decision. I don't know you used GameSpy for Civ 4. Traxxas has been using GameSpy for every multiplayer title they've ever done. I apologize if you don't like GameSpy, but on 360, Microsoft provides everything, and on PS3, Sony provides nothing. So we have to use what's available. Tell us the story and narrative of your most recent and our most memorable game of Civ Rev to date. Well, my most recent was just the other day. I'm going through on the 360 because I want to get all the achievement points because, you know, I can. So, uh, so I'm going through on King right now because you get those achievements. So I was playing, I can't remember. I think I was going for an economic victory. I was playing as America. And it was one of those games where I was so big towards the end that I could have won a cultural victory, but I was going for an economic victory. So, you know, I could have bought my way straight to a cultural victory, but I just kept keeping the money because I wanted the economic victory. So it was that. My most memorable, you know, a lot of my more memorable ones, unfortunately, don't work because they balance them out of the game. One of the really neat things about Civ Rev is towards the end of the game, it can get really hectic because all the civs could be close to a victory. And so earlier, what used to work, if one civ was close to winning a science victory, so they've already sent their ship out to Alpha Centauri, all you have to do to keep them from winning is take their capital. And so one of the more fun things I used to be able to do is as soon as I saw they were about to win, and let's say I'm like two turns away from winning myself, but they're like one turn away from Alpha Centauri, you send a nuke to their capital, and poof, they lose. And there's no way for them to come back from that. Now, unfortunately, that got balanced out of the game. So now what you got to do is you got to nuke their capital, and then you have to actually capture their capital, because nuking doesn't destroy the capital city anymore. So that's a little disappointing. So it actually makes it a lot harder and maybe a little more hectic. Beyond that, I mean, I've played the game so many times that, yeah, I just have way, 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 way more memories of different victory conditions and just hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of games in my head. Born and raised in New York, California has been Jason's home since the fall of 2007. Your start in the gaming industry began in 1998 when you founded Looney Games and ran it for the next two and a half years. It's from that that you're probably better known in some circles as Looney Boy than uh, Jason2K as your handle. How would you overview Looney Games for someone who had never heard of, let alone visited it before? First of all, I technically got my start a couple of years before that. Looney Games started in 1998, and it kind of came out of... I had been working for GameSpy, and I'd been working for Planet Quake, and a bunch of the stuff in the Quake scene for a couple of years already. And Looney Games came out of that. It was basically my attempt to pull together everybody I had met over the last couple of years. And it was my own bizarre, quirky gaming website. I wanted to show people how games were made. I wanted to do the kind of interviews you couldn't really see anywhere. I wanted to do strange feature articles. And I really wanted to make the kind of website that didn't exist at the time and is kind of a little more commonplace now. So, you know, so yeah, so we ran for two and a half years. And I think we're probably at this point best remembered for being, if we're remembered at all, as being the place that Penny Arcade started from. We ran Penny Arcade for the first year before they took off and went off on their own and now have taken over the universe. It was a gaming website that was devoted to nothing but content at a time when most websites were just news. We had no news. We were nothing but articles and features. Why did you stop looting games? I know you've got an explanation on your website, but just maybe an abbreviated version, however you want to put it. I started looting games when I was in college. And when I was in college, I had you know all the time in the world. And after graduating, I went to work for Blues News full-time, and I started writing for other places as well, and I really just didn't have a whole lot of time. The first year, it was brunt of the workload was actually done by me. Most of the articles were written by me. Most of the actual, all of the back-end work was done by me. The art was shared, obviously. I didn't do any of that. But there was a lot of work on it that was done almost entirely by myself. The second year, I started to move a little bit more towards the background and hand off as much of it as I possibly could because I had all these other things to do. But uh, even that, eventually, I just didn't have the time to really do it as much as I wanted to anymore. It, it eventually, it I don't know, it just kind of, we went on hiatus and we never came back. And it's been, you know, eight years. <laughs> so someday, maybe something will happen there. I'm going to be posting an update in August for the 10th anniversary. 
But uh, other than that, I think Looney Games is very much dead, which makes me a little sad, but, you know. Well, as a bit of a tie-in, on July 26th, so one week from when we're recording this, a Poulton will turn 10 years old. That is fantastic. Congratulations of 10 years of activity, unlike my eight years of inactivity and a little more than two years of actual content. <laughs> <laughs> Well, with all the content on there, it might take some time to get through it all. I had a chance to look at some of the articles briefly, and I know you had said in the preface that you know some of them are a little dated now, but some of them are still quite relevant. I think so. So you've had a forum account on a Poulton since October 2006, but you haven't posted, and it doesn't seem that you've logged in or hardly ever since, but how and when did you find the site? How often do you visit? And when you're visiting, whether it's a Poulton or CFC or even the official 2K forums or what have you, are there particular things that you're looking for when you do? When I first discovered Politan would be, I know I linked to it back in my Blues News days, so that would have been 10 years ago, so pretty early on. When I visit the forums, I lurk in the forums a lot. I lurk in all the forums, so that would be Politan and Sid Fanatics and obviously the official 2K forums. I try to visit them every day. Usually what I'm looking for is general feedback. I like to know what people are saying about the game. I like to know what the current issues are. You know, sometimes it makes me, it can be a little frustrating because I can't really, I don't have a response to people a lot of the time, so I don't bother posting. If people are complaining about an issue that I know we're working on, but I don't want to say anything because it may change, then I'm not going to post anything. But I do try and visit every day when I can. Certainly right now I'm visiting every day, just because we're looking for stuff for patches. When there's nothing to talk about and there's no real news, then larger chunks go between forum visits. But I do try and visit as often as possible. You know, you can always visit the off-topic forum if you, uh, <laughs> if, if there's nothing Civ going on there, you know. <laughs> I'm not trying to plug or influence you in any possible way, but. Uh. <laughs> right. Have you seen the fan-operated CivGameOfTheWeek.com site that tracks the PS3 and Xbox 360 leaderboards? What do you think of it? Purpose, operation? I love it. Even when we were making the game, we knew we can't officially do that. Microsoft and Sony and Nintendo would not allow us to create a site that merges all the leaderboards in any way, shape, or form. So we figured it was the kind of thing where the fans would take over, and they have. My only suggestion to them is that they add DS. I visit it, like, once a week. I like to see how the leaderboards are coming. And I think it's really cool that they put up the maps. And, yeah, I think it's a great site, and I'm very happy that it happened so quickly after release. And I know you're not the only one asking for DS support as well, so hopefully they'll be able to find someone that will do that. <laughs> I would also like to see a merged form, because that's the kind of thing we definitely would never be able to do, where they take the leaderboard list and they just kind of merge the scores and they create a worldwide leaderboard list, which would be awesome. Ah. We can't do that, so the fans might as well. The world's greatest strategy game comes to consoles and handheld. Some people like the Firaxlish that's in CivRev, other people don't. I personally like it, and I'm just going to throw a quick question in here. Uh, Jason, what is your favorite piece of Firaxlish in CivRev? <laughs> oh, if, gosh. If you remember. <laughs> oh, man, they're all burned into my skull. Um, when you play a game for years on end, and you hear the same 10-second snippets of Firaxlish over and over and over and over again... Some of the things that Domestic Advisor says are probably my favorites. They're just so bizarre and wacky and make absolutely no sense. I like those, and I like... Actually, you know what? I take that back. The ones that I like the best are the leader ones. The ones where it sounds like the language they're speaking, but it obviously isn't. I like the ones Gandhi says, and I like the German ones a lot, because they almost could be German. If you don't speak the language, it sounds like it might as well be German. <laughs> so, those are my favorite. Well, I'll take your first answer, just from the little bit that I played during testing. I believe it was the domestic advisor who has the uh, follum follum line. I always like that. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a geek. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> In episode 49, Jason, there was actually a quiz that all of us took, which was, are we a nerd, a geek, or a dork? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Can you be all three? <laughs> The quiz said if you're a little bit of all three, where you're less than 50% of any one of the three, you're actually <laughs> Joe Normal. <laughs> the, I, I, well, the, can't you be 100% on all three? I mean, is it... <laughs> <laughs> I think a few of us were acting like we were pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm all three, so... <laughs> Other than this interview, perhaps, have you listened to Polycast in the past? And if so, what are your favorite segments or other points of the show? And what could we do to improve? And, of course, would you be willing to appear on it again? <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have a whole lot of time to listen to podcasts anymore. My commute is, like, five minutes long. I live right around the corner from the office. 
so I don't get nearly as much time to listen to podcasts anymore. So the last one I listened to was the one with Elizabeth, which was fabulous, obviously. And yes, I'd be willing to appear again, but otherwise, no, I don't really have any other feedback. You could circle your office several dozen times to <laughs> listen to an episode. I guess I could. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for listening to our Polycast Focus Sivrev number two on the Sivrev post release. We've had with us Jason Bergman or Jason 2K. Thank you for having me. And of course, thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, wait. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> and myself, Cardamandua. <laughs> Is there anything else about Sivrev or otherwise that you wanted to touch upon that we haven't already, Jason? Not that I can think of. Sivrev is out, and I encourage everybody to go buy it. I like to think we did a really good job, and it's a great game. If you like Civ, you will love Sivrev. Do you have any questions for us, Jason? Why haven't you bought Sivrev yet? Okay, okay, this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I will. All right. Right now, I'll go. Go buy a DS and Sivrev. I mean, who needs to pay the phone bill, really? <laughs> buy it for other platforms. Even though you don't have them, buy them anyway. I'll tell you what, Jason. You guys buy me an Xbox 360, I'll buy the game. <laughs> <laughs> How's that sound? That sounds fair. Yeah, sure. that, that sounds fair. Right. <laughs> uh, if he gets an Xbox, I want the DS. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. <laughs> You started in the gaming industry uh, back in 1980. Oh, shoot. See, this is a blooper. Excellent. You started in the gaming in... This is a horribly worded question. Your start in the gaming industry began. There we go. And soon to be released this month in North America as of this recording. Well, I guess it has been released. That, well, yeah. That, sorry. that I wrote that uh, A that long question. time ago. And uh, just been released this week in North America. Or... And I apologize for the phone ringing in the background. That's my wife's work phone uh, in her office. Um, uh, that's okay. One of our regular co-hosts, his phone rings all the time. So it's, <laughs> it's true. It's self. Whereas, um, like in Civ 4, you could... This is kind of a weird word to question, Dad. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Your question, Dad. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, can Sivrev players shave the... <laughs> shave? <laughs> we hope. Some might not be old enough for that, but uh, let's try that again. <laughs> that was a long and rambling explanation, but yes. <laughs> Do you think online gaming communities are too male-oriented? Or, excuse me, like, can I start over? Because it's not oriented, it's dominated. Do you... <laughs> they are male-oriented well, and... Some games. Oh, just kidding. Sorry, I have my own agenda, apparently. Um... <laughs> excuse me while I repeat this myself. They're paternalistic, sure. <laughs> Earlier this month, you spent two days in New York City. What was it like to return there? Did you visit the 2K office where you used to work? I'll just preface this by saying that it's a bit unfair that I ended up having you read that there, Annalise. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't actually make it to New York. As for voiceover work, uh, I did for GTA 4. I'm one of the voices in the crowd somewhere, and I haven't found myself yet. I keep randomly running over pedestrians in GTA 4 trying to find myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in there somewhere. Because, yes, Annalise, he's recording on a Mac right now. Oh, no. I <laughs> <laughs> And looking forward to actually being able to uh, to play the game, but uh, now I got at this uh, this interview. Like, thanks a lot, appreciate it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay, Dan doesn't have a life. It's all. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Dan. <sighs> uh, and Annalie no longer has a position here. So yeah. Oh, stop. <laughs> I mean, yes. Oh. <laughs> Now, normally, at the end of recordings when we're doing an episode, we have a summary to do, but we really that really doesn't apply here. That's easy for me to do. I mean, all I would probably say is, oh, we look at introductory questions, and then platform, and then gameplay, then setup, then content, then reflection, then industry, then miscellaneous. Woo, look at that. I did that already. Ha. I didn't mean to. Whew. <laughs> you overachiever, you. Briefly, your other podcast experience, you said you'd been on a couple. Yep. How does this, and not necessarily names or saying that ours is better, because of course it is, it's really, we don't have to say that, we just know. <laughs> Sid Meier's Civilization Revolution.
Saturday, July 19th, 2008. Soundtrack courtesy Civilization 4, Warlords, Beyond the Sword, and Civilization Revolution. Copyright 2008, Bolton Civilization Site at Bolton.net.